unearned uh, gerrymandered legislative majorities to rewrite history and, and engineer election outcomes. So we know that all of that is on the ballot this year. Um, and I can't wait to hear how folks on the panel are feeling about state legislatures and these midterms. And I just want to go into the conversation saying just a couple of things about the midterms. I, first, I know folks are fretting. Many folks are fretting about the polls. Can't wait to t you know hear what hear what our panelists have to say about the polls. Um, okay, and EJ, would you like me to pause? I will pause for just a moment. We have a technical. Um, ah, I guess we're okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Apologies there. Um, all I wanted to say about polls, can't wait to hear everybody's thoughts on polls. Stop fretting about the polls. That's what I have to say. They're crazy making. Uh, as, as Mike Podhorzer, who's kind of a godfather of uh, progressive strategy, likes to say, we're within the margin of effort, right? Um, we were always going to be underdogs this year. The fact that this is a fight, it, the fact that enthusiasm is tied, it's historic. It's a tremendous accomplishment. Don't worry about the polls. Uh, we're within that margin of effort, just keep going. The outcome is not determined here. Um, and then the last thing I wanna say as we go into this is that we I really encourage us all to, to not just think about the outcome in terms of this year, um, but to think in terms of decades. Uh, whatever happens this year will happen this year, but we really need to be doing exactly what we're doing here, which is talking and thinking and strategizing on a longer term basis as well. Um, so we're in the right place at the right time for this conversation. I can't wait. Um, I'll turn things over to Shaniqua to say a few words about both save and intro our panelists and kick things off. Yeah, thanks, Gabby. And thank you to everyone who's joining us today. Um, yeah, we're two weeks out from the election. And uh, yeah, I think we're running on on fumes now, but we're going to keep pushing to the end. And we hope that you all are doing the same and that after this, you'll um, head over to Sister, Di Sister District's website, but also Vote Save America and find um, volunteer opportunities. This is really going to be the final push that ultimately determines what happens in, in the midterms this year. Um, but with that, I know we're all eager to get started with this conversation. So I'm going to introduce our panelists and then hop right into questions. Um, our first panelist is David Daly, who is a senior fellow at Fair Vote and the author of um, Rat Fucked, and I, well, I said it already at this point, the true story behind the secret plan to steal America's democracy, which helped spark the recent drive to reform gerrymandering as well as unrigged how America Americans are battling back to save democracy. Next, we have Dr. Abdul El Saeed, physician, epidemiologist, educator, author, speaker, and also host of Crooked Media's America Dissected podcast. Uh, and finally, we have Jessica Post, who is the president of the Democratic Legislative Campaign Committee, uh, which, of course, is a Democratic committee uh, in charge of all of um, or helping get Democrats elected to state um, state legislatures across the country. Um, and just a little bit of housekeeping for those, well, for those, everyone's watching on YouTube. Um, we have closed captioning available for you all there. Um, I is, sorry, maybe it's my screen. Oh, um, Jessica, if you can hear me, feel free to um, come on camera whenever you're ready. But um, Dave, the first question is for you. So um, we'll give Jessica a bit of time, but uh, get started here. Um, yeah. so. At a high level, just wondering if you can help us kind of connect the dots about why this year's state legislature elections um, are absolutely critical to the future of democracy and our civil rights and why progressives would be making a big mistake if they don't start um, seriously prioritizing uh, state legislature races. You're absolutely right. Um, uh, thank you. Shaniqua, thank you, Gabby. Thank you, Sister District and Vote Save America. And it's a pleasure to be on this panel with such esteemed colleagues in this in this field of trying to protect um, and defend our democracy. Um, we're two weeks out, and these elections are extraordinarily consequential. Um, and to try to drive home the point of how consequential these state legislative races are. Um, I would go back to 2010 and I would talk about the midterms, uh, you know, 12 years ago, uh, right after we elected a Democratic uh, president. 
and perhaps breathe a little easy, right? Um, Republicans executed an audacious um, and democracy changing strategy that was designed around winning, not the White House, not the Senate. They wanted to capture state legislatures. And they did this for many reasons, right? Uh, first, because there's a, a lot of important policy uh, victories uh, that can be gained by winning state legislatures. We are seeing this right now in the fight over voting rights and the fight over reproductive rights, over climate, over labor. Uh, this has resonated for the last decade. Uh, but they also wanted to control these state legislative chambers because 2011 was going to be a redistricting year and they wanted to remake the maps that we elect not only state legislatures on, but also the US House. And they were so extraordinarily effective at this in the 2010 midterms that in 2012, when the American people reelected Barack Obama, expanded the Democratic majority in the US uh, 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 Senate, and gave Democrats 1.4 million more votes for the US House nationwide. Um, Republicans held a 234-201 advantage in the House anyway, and proceeded to block gun control after Sandy Hook and uh, 50 different votes to re repeal Obamacare and a government shutdown over the debt ceiling. Uh, what we saw back in those years, um, you know, so effectively, President Obama's uh, second term agenda died on the vine on the night he was reelected because we lost state legislative races in crucial states in 2010. We have not been able to reverse those chamber losses in Pennsylvania, in Wisconsin, in North Carolina, in Michigan, in Ohio, Florida, ever since because the power to draw those lines is, is so crucial and, and so powerful these days with the kind of technology that they're able to use to do this. Uh, and so state legislatures are the beginning of the problem that we have with entrenched one party minority rule. And if we're going to win it back, if we're going to change things, we have to start by unraveling this at the knot where it was first uh, um, uh, rat fucked, for a lack of a better word. Yeah, well, that's the truth. Um, and, you know, as we've talked about, you know, this, this year, 2024 is on the ballot this year, right? Um, whoever we elect to our state legislatures this year will be in office during that crucial post-24 election period. And so, um, you know, the, the stakes couldn't be higher. And so, Jessica, I'd love to, to chat with you about the state of play this year. Um, you know, historically, the president's party loses seats in Congress and, and state legislative seats in the midterm. Um, but this year, and you know, that's typically understood as a referendum on the president's party, although it's, you know, often really more or at least equally a reflection of out party enthusiasm, right? The folks, the way that we felt in 2018, you know, that's how Republicans might be feeling this year. But this, you know, as we were talking earlier at the top, this year's different, right? We're in a fight, which is historic for us to be at this in this position, um, you know, going into into a midterm even um, is, is historic. But of course, there's still going to be a huge fight. We have a fight ahead. These are tiny, close races. No one knows better than Jessica that, you know, we lost uh, the House in Virginia last year by 733 votes out of more than 3 million cast, right? So, um, you know, there's all of that going on. In the meantime, we have these insurrectionists running for state ledge, and the DLCC uh, has recently published a, a, a tremendous resource documenting each of those um, individuals and, and the impact that they could have on their state legislatures and all the rest. So I'm curious what you're watching in this year's election. Um, what can we be, you know, how should we set our expectations? What's in play? What, what are you thinking about, Jessica? 
Thanks so much for the introduction, Gabby. And I think David did a really nice job of explaining the background. Um, and he does, if you haven't read David's books, we used to, when we onboarded staff at DLCC, we used to, we used to give them a copy of David's first book um, because we just wanted people to kind of know the background. So it looked like everything he said is right. I mean, I think Republicans, the only thing I would add, and I think David covers this in his book, is that Republicans thought that there wasn't a path back to the presidency. And they thought there wasn't a path back to controlling the U.S. Senate. So that's why they were dead focused on controlling the U.S. House. And that's also why we're seeing them pass so many voter suppression laws uh, across the country, because they're trying to shrink the electorate to eliminate the wide range of the Obama coalition. So students, voters of color, um, they they really are interested in, in making the electorate smaller and not as reflective. And so that's something that we see across the country. But to talk about this year's landscape. So we flipped a lot of legislative chambers in 2018 together with Sister District and uh, and our, our folks at Vote Save America. So thank you so much for that partnership. We, um, you know, looking from west to east, the Republicans started this cycle saying that they were going to flip the Washington State Legislature, which we only flipped in 2017. They said that they were going to flip the Oregon Legislature. They are essentially out of Washington state, which is great news, but they are spending a million dollars in Oregon. They've spent more, our Republican counterpart, the Republican State Leadership Committee. You know, we've raised a record amount of money at DLCC. We've raised 47 million so far this cycle, um, but the Republicans are probably on pace to raise 90 million. And while they have a broader electoral mandate, they, they invest a lot in state Supreme Courts, secretaries of states races, ag commissioners, they still have a, an enormous fundraising advantage. And that's also compounded by the advantage in the states. You know, just like a incumbent often has a fundraising advantage, the majority party has quite an advantage in terms of fundraising for the lobbyists, pack and lobby core around the, around the capital. So power entrenches power. That's certainly something we've seen over the years. So where else is in play? We're looking to defend the Colorado State Senate. That nonpartisan commission uh, did not... We, we Republicans did a, a really good job of kind of infiltrating these nonpartisan commissions. So we're defending the Colorado State Senate. In addition to that, we're defending the Minnesota House and both chambers in Maine. So those are sort of the protects that we're watching really closely. We're also uh, on the offense in a few places. These new maps uh, in Michigan are not as totally fair as we would have wanted, especially the state house map, but they're much more reflective. And, you know, in Michigan, and I know uh, Dr. El Sayed's an expert there as well as across the country, but that's a place where Democrats have won the popular vote in those state legislative districts basically every single time and have never won the state house. The state Senate map is fair for the first time in, in literally 40 years. So we think that we can uh, make progress there, if not flip one of those chambers. Then looking across the country, we also have the Minnesota State Senate, a perennial target of ours. Um, that map is challenging, but we think that it's very possible. And then both chambers in New Hampshire. You know, New Hampshire is really a, a state where abortion rights are, are really valued. And the governor of New Hampshire signed a really restrictive abortion ban. And then finally, we're looking to protect Democrats from going into the super minority in North Carolina and Wisconsin, just to make sure that those vetoes can be supported by hopefully de the Democratic governors in Wisconsin. And then, of course, Roy Cooper is not on the ballot in North Carolina. We also are looking at, I feel like this is a mouthful, Pennsylvania, which is huge in terms of electoral certification. Um, that's a legislature that will be sworn in at the end of 2024 before the uh, before the electoral votes are sort of certified. So this is really, we have sort of two bites of the apple to get in front of um, what is likely going to be a um, Republican attempt to overturn presidential election results again. And then we also are building power in Georgia um, and in Arizona. So those are, that's sort of the national map as we see it. Um, we're watching really closely. You know, I think there are key races all over the country. We are trying to balance the, the challenge of this cycle with the opportunities of some of these new states and new districts coming out of redistricting. And the stakes couldn't be higher. Thank Just you. Thing before Shanika jumps in, I'm curious for your thoughts on Nevada. I think of Nevada as this year's Virginia, potentially, where Democrats are a little uh, um, uh, in much more danger than it might seem. Um, re really worried about both majorities. If you might speak to that just super briefly, I think it'd be great. 
Gabby, thank you so much for the reminder. And my like long national maps spiel, I forgot Nevada, which is a state we really feel like is at risk. Now, remember in 2014, which is sort of the last comparable election, Democrats lost both majorities in the Nevada legislature because turnout really cratered in Nevada. Same story in New Mexico, another state that we're looking to defend that seems to be potentially in slightly better shape. In Nevada, um, it yeah, we've had to flip that chamber back in 2016. So two factors, like one, we're watching turnout really closely because turnout is very volatile. And then look, Nevada was especially hit hard by COVID. And so there's an economic recovery because of the reliance in Clark County on sort of the entertainment industry that we're monitoring really closely. And then a lot of people left, right? So that's the other thing that we're seeing is like, who is this new Nevada electorate? And um, even though the voting laws have changed tremendously, kudos to the Democratic majorities in Nevada, uh, we're still concerned about making sure the the vote is turned out appropriately. And you know, with competitive races at the top of the ticket, it it, it becomes even more important. Thank you, and thank you for that. Um, yeah. I think Nevada is one of the states that everyone thought was fine and okay. And now we're just remembering that we need to, to be playing everywhere and paying attention to everywhere. But um, Abdul, this next question is for you. Jessica uh, touched on um, you know, the two chambers in Michigan, um, that the Senate looks a little better than the House, um, but you are from Michigan. Um, you've had a front row seat to the ways that Republicans in the legislature have used the power that they've gained from being in a gerrymandered majority to pursue a harmful agenda, uh, from public health, education, preempting cities from passing progressive measures. What do you think we can learn from Michigan's battle for fair control of its state legislature? What is at stake in the state and um, what are Democrats, if you don't want to, you know, <laughs> predict anything, you can answer it however you want. But what do you think Democrats chances are this year in the state? Yeah, well, first of all, I just want to echo um, just a big thank you to uh, friends at Sister District and, and Vote Save America. You, you all have been doing amazing work and um, just a real privilege to be with uh, Jessica and David. I, I want to um, just to remind folks uh, to a to a time not that long ago, but in the before times, before uh, we all suffered through this pandemic um, that is still ongoing to the Flint water crisis. And the thing about power in the hands of a minority, because in Michigan, there's about a 10 point differential in party affiliation. There are about 10% more uh, Democrats than there are Republicans. But in the years under Governor Engler, uh, which was the 90s, early 2000s, uh, the legislature set about consolidating its power and drawing lines that basically meant that it was near impossible uh, for uh, Democrats to win either the House or the Senate. To, to put it in perspective, imagine I just told you there's a 10 point swing for Democrats, but there has been a Senate supermajority uh, for Republicans for the past several decades. And people understand that in Flint, there was a decision made to change the water source without adding corrosion control. But what they don't always connect that to is a set of public policies under a Republican governor and a Republican state legislature that cemented power uh, and also took it away from cities like Flint. So what happened was uh, Governor Snyder uh, at the time used his um, gerrymandered majorities to pass a bill uh, known as the emergency manager law. And that law basically took away the right to self-determination in communities in Michigan that had too high a debt burden. And what they did is basically abrogated the power of the mayor or the, the city council uh, and gave it to an unelected bureaucrat um, in the form of an emergency manager. And that emergency manager had one job. It wasn't about trying to run the city in an equitable, balanced, effective, efficient way. It was entirely about trying to address the debt. And guess what? What cities were subject to emergency management? They were predominantly Black, poor cities that were made Black and poor as a function of a whole bunch of legislative priorities uh, for decades that took wealth and power outside of cities and put them in suburbs, uh, built a huge highway system, because of course it's Michigan, uh, to move folks out. And it was under an emergency manager um, that the Flint water crisis happened. But here's a crazy thing. So the, the people of the state of Michigan passed a referendum to repeal the emergency manager law. 
people understood that this was completely a-democratic. They passed, like the people of the state of Michigan all voted in a referendum to repeal emergency management. And then the legislature turned around and passed it again in a budget package so it couldn't be repealed. And that's after which, after that point, that's when the Flint water crisis ultimately ended up happening. I was appointed to rebuild a health department in the city of Detroit that had been shut down when the city was facing bankruptcy there. So the things I want you to understand is that A, um, to echo the point that's already been made, is that power consolidates. And when you put power in the hands of a uh, minority hell bent on sustaining that power, it means that they're going to flush democracy down with them. And when that happens, real people in real places get hurt, right? We know that uh, abortion rights are on the ballot this year, but it, the history of Flint it, it is entirely written in the uh, completely unadulterated pursuit of power over a set of cities that were forced under non-democratic leadership um, and real people suffered the consequences. Real people were exposed to lead. Real people died because of those choices. And then the last thing I want to, to say is that we have a choice in this matter. The thing about the, the attempt to take away democracy is that it always has to run through democracy. And however good or bad a set of polls are, we're really good, unfortunately, as Democrats, as getting super anxious um, and then winding ourselves up in the weeks where our interventions matter most. So my, I mean, we could talk about polls, but, but really the thing that I can tell you is that, you know, a great swimmer or a great runner, uh, they're told that they should never look to the right or left and see where other swimmers or runners are because they break stride. And so we can't do the thing that we always do, which is get really scared about whether or not we're going to run and then break our stride before we hit the finish line. So the thing we got to do is keep our heads focused on that finish line, right? If you were planning on making calls, if you were planning on donating, if you were planning on knocking doors, if you were planning on signing uh, 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 AV chasing um, pieces of mail, if you were planning on having conversations with people you know and love, if you were planning on send text, sending text messages to that one cousin who you know is going to vote the right way but might not vote at all, whatever it is that you want to do, make sure you do that and then multiply that by three because, because that's what we have in front of us. We have literally two weeks in front of us. And we understand that, um, that the challenges uh, of sustaining our democracy, protecting uh, our legislatures, winning legislatures for the first time, like in the state of Michigan, that has everything to do with what we do between now and election day. And so let's not um, let's not break stride toward the end here. Margin of effort. We are within the margin of effort. The outcome is not guaranteed. I I love that, and it's so it's so true. Um, and so I'd love to get a, shift the conversation a little bit to thinking uh, longer term. Um, you all have been in this work for a long time, and I'm really curious for your perspective about what you've seen in your work and your experiences about the difference in how the right and the left has approached building power in state legislatures. Um, you know, I it see it, it. You know, what I've observed in in my time in this work is that there, ha I believe, there to be a long-term disinvestment in building state power. Um, on the left and an overinvestment in federal strategies, litigation, advocacy to basically the mutual exclusion of building state power. We could have been doing both all along as the right has always done. They've pursued both strategies, but we didn't. And I think, and I'm curious what you all think that's, um, you know, uh, very, very eager for your thoughts. I think it goes back a very long way. I think it goes back to basically the founding of the country. and. Uh, and political ideology and the idea that conservatives have a deep emotional connection to state power, right? Back back to the Civil War, um, you know, the, the recalcitrance uh, uh, um, toward toward Reconstruction in the Southern states, call it states' rights, whatever whatever you know the parlance is in the moment. But progressives don't have an emotional or an ideological connection to the idea of state power and structures that we see in the world follow ideas and without you know a good uh, theoretical basis for doing the work we have this massive um, uh, overinvestment in the federal and underinvestment and it comes in, in the state and it comes the consequences are these you know anemic institutions and and all the rest as well as I think 
what we see on the ground with ballot roll off. And I just wanted to flag that today, my colleague Mallory Roman and I had a piece, um, we published a piece on CNN about our research into down ballot roll off. And our findings were very staggering. So looking across the last 10 years, across 10 battleground states, Democrats in contested state legislative races experienced ballot roll off 80% of the time, which is a lot, but wait, but wait. Republicans in contest, running in contested state legislative districts only experienced roll off 37% of the time, less than 40% of the time. So we have this chronic um, roll off problem. We have this anemia in our institutions around state power. We have these challenges. It goes back a long way. Very curious for your thoughts on this historical perspective, um, what you've seen in, 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 in how the right and the left have approached power building um, and what we need to do next. So maybe we could just go um, Dave, Jessica, and then Abul, um, uh, for your thoughts on that, sure. That's a that's a big question. Um, let me do my best to take a bite at it, and um, I know everybody else will have interesting thoughts as well. Um, I would. I mean, I think you're right. I think it, you can trace this back to the founding of the nation. Um, I would track it back um, to within my lifetime, I track it back to the early 1970s when the uh, Chamber of Commerce in this country asked a man named Lewis Powell uh, to write a, a memo in response to what was happening um, in the 1960s and, and Ralph Nader and sort of the, um, the growth of public interest law firms and consumerism in this country that was making a, a real impact and the, the sense of um, on campuses against the Vietnam War. Uh, and uh, uh, Powell effectively drew up a memo and said, big business has to get into this fight and conservatives need to build um, a think tank infrastructure and an ideas infrastructure to sort of battle what Nader and some of the, the public interest groups around the country and the consumer groups were doing. Um, and Republicans not only embraced this memo and um, built things like the Heritage Foundation and the American Enterprise Institute off of this sort of the, the, the crux, the, the, the tip of the spear of the conservative intellectual um, leadership movement, uh, they appointed Lewis Powell to the U.S. Supreme Court. <laughs> uh, so Powell is not a nobody who was simply writing a memo. They put Powell as one of nine lifetime appointees on the Supreme Court who throughout the 1970s and 1980s ruled against voting rights in some crucial cases in favor of big business in really important cases like uh, Buckley versus Vallejo, right? Uh, that were sort of the, uh, uh, the early uh, uh, cases that led to the Citizens United decision. Uh, so, it's 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 a really short putt from what Powell lays out in his memo to what similar memos laid out regarding how conservatives should build an intellectual structure to take back the courts and the growth of the Federalist Society through how they could build a policy. Um, a uh, program through things like ALEC, the Americans Legislative Exchange Council, which creates so much of the model legislation that you see pushed through these gerrymandered legislature time after time after time. But then if you go back to 2010 again, and I know I keep talking about 2010, but I think it's a crucial election if you wanna understand the, the state of our democracy and how we got here. Um, if you look at what the Republican State Legislative Committee, which ran this redistricting play in 2010, did, um, this was made possible by $30 million of investment from big business, from the Chamber of Commerce, from Alcoa and Philip Morris and some of these huge uh, banks and pharmaceutical companies that were freed from 
just months earlier by the Citizens United case, all of this dark money allowed to flow, flow into our system thanks to the conservative strategy to win back courts. And then they were free once they gerrymandered those, once they've spent the money to gerrymander the legislatures, they were free to go after voting rights because those same justices on the court that took care of Citizens United and unleashed all of this dark money also began with Shelby County and Northwest Austin and going after our voting rights. Um, and by 2019, in, in Rucho versus Common Cause, they had solidified these gerrymanders. So this is a long-term effort in which every piece of it has helped sort of wash the next piece. I would, I'll jump in and I, I would really agree with what David said. I mean, look, we had, we lost 21 state legislative chambers in one night in 2010, and we're still working to regain them. Right now, as Democrats, we have 37 state legislative chambers. If you include the governing coalition that we have in Alaska, and Republicans have 62. And that is, that is, we've gained six, I think, since I started the LCC in 2016. We've done everything we can. You know, we were a, a 12 person committee with, about $16 million. And now we're, uh, you know, I think we'll be a $53 million committee. We know that people are spending, we, so many groups are spending increased resources at the state legislative level, um, but it's still just not enough, one, to go toe to toe with the Republican state leadership committee, in part because as David articulated, these Republicans get such a great return on investment. They got uh, corporate deregulation in the states. And I'll also say that people at the very top of the Republican Party were involved in the strategy. So you have Carl Rove still sitting on the board of the RSLC, and he was calling a lot of these shots. And so he he really embraced um, the strategy. And, and, you know, David lays this out really well in his books that Chris Jankowski at the RSLC sort of came through. I think the toughest thing for me, you know, because I feel like I'm banging my head against all that state power David's totally right. We've, and I think Gabby articulated this too, we've focused so much on federal power because the federal government has come in to save us so many times, right? Whether it was with school integration or whether it was with LGBTQ equality and marriage equality, the federal government came in, whether it was the U.S. Supreme Court. And I still think when I talk to a number of progressives and Democratic donors, people are still holding out hope that maybe John Roberts will come around on in you know future yeah future cases the thing that's the hardest for me is that you know your dollars go so much further at the state legislative level these these republican um these republican super PACs that spend at the US Senate level and spend at the congressional level i mean they're at millions of dollars amy mcgrath for example running against mcconnell raised 96 million dollars i just told you we in that same 2020 election cycle raised 52 million to try to help legislators all across the country, you know, with the help of, of course, folks that were supporting candidates directly through Sister District, Vote Save America, et cetera, and just, you know, donating directly in their states. So the many of these state legislative races, you know, as Gabby said, are won and lost um, by just a couple of votes. And, you know, recently I was out canvassing on Sunday and I talked to a woman at her door and, you know, she had two young children and she was like, oh, I didn't even know there was an election this year. And so while that is potentially discouraging to hear, that is why we canvass, right? That is why we, we go through multiple modes of contact to try to get to, to voters face to face. Um, and that's why we have to sort of like layer our campaign communications because who knows sort of what's going to grab a voter's attention. So it was a young mom and I was able to articulate what the state legislator had done to pull down state 20 million in state funds for childcare. And that was extremely persuasive to her. And so the power in the states, I think, is just completely misunderstood by our federal counterparts. I mean, I'll tell you, when I went to the DLCC, I was a junior staffer there in 2010. So I witnessed this massive Republican spending come in at the end. And a, uh, a one of the as someone who's a, a TV consultant that had worked at the DCCC said to me, well, Jessica, you can play in the majors or you can play in the minors. <laughs> And what he meant was like, you can play in the farm system, which is sort of what state legislatures were viewed as at, for years, or you can play in the major league, the congressional 
races. Often folks will ask me like, well, what do you want to do after this? Do you want to advise U.S. Senate candidates? And, you know, I already did that, right? Like I advise U.S. Senate candidates, congressional candidates. Um, and one of the ch biggest challenges I had and part of the reason I came back to DLCC was because I knew we were recruiting women to run in congressional districts that they probably could not win. And I was having tough conversations with women in the Midwest who would have made incredible numbers of Congress that I just had to say, I don't think that this district is go is winnable in the long term. Now, fortunately, a lot of those things have changed. Um, but I think there's just a misunderstanding of the levers of state based power within our party. Folks do not understand that voting rights, LGBTQ equality, abortion rights, all of those are state policies. And I, it just seems like sometimes people think like, well, maybe the governor can fix it. Maybe somebody at another level of power can fix it. It all of that comes from state legislatures <laughs> I, and it's complicated, right? There's 7,000 plus seats. And um, in a state like Pennsylvania, there's 45 targeted races, which is close to the entire targets of the U.S. House map. So it's overwhelming, but um, we have a great team and uh, we're able to track it really well and to make sure that resources go exactly where they need to go. Um, but I'll tell you, you know, you'll be able to meet your state legislator. You'll be able to talk to them about any key issues and you'll be able to build that relationship directly uh, if you're willing to go volunteer on a state legislative race. And I think um, people find that, I think, really powerful. Um, you know, we have a legislator in Delaware who is convinced that medical marijuana um, should be legal because a constituent came out to volunteer and sort of told their story. So you have you have quite a bit of influence and on both the outcome of the election, but you'll have a direct voice in your state if you're willing to go out and and have those conversations in state legislatures. I have very little more uh, to add. Um, both David and Jessica were very exhaustive. I'll just say this. Um, I think sometimes as Democrats, we think about politics as if we all live uh, in an episode of the West Wing. Like it's going to be a president of the United States who is motivated by the courage of his convictions and says just the right words. And then the country will see the light and things will be great. Um, and I think what Republicans have never suffered is the burden of being correct. <laughs> and so they understand that this is just about power. And so they build power and they see it as a long game. And so they make dent after dent after dent and we're waiting for a beautiful speech. And so if we're serious about, about leveraging power to do what is right, then we have to put in just as much, if not more effort. And too often, right, the fact that we're actually right on issues has saved us. And that's why we sit in this moment where um, everything feels like it, it sits on a knife's edge. I do think that in this moment, how wrong they are is becoming more and more obvious. And th the, the sad thing to me is that sometimes that leaves us just doing this. We're like, don't you see? They're just wrong. Um, and that's just not enough. Actually, you just kind of have to go and have painstaking conversations over and over and over about why they're wrong and why we're right and do it with the courage of our convictions, the kindness that we um, that, that, that motivates our broader goals um, and, and seeing every single person as an opportunity uh, to have a conversation about who we are and who we want to be. Um, and so they've done the work and I, I hate to say it, but they've done the work and um, you got great folks like Jessica and David and Shaniqua and Gabby who have, are doing the work too. And the question is whether or not the rest of us are willing to show up and do the painstaking work. It's not glorious, right? You're not gonna find the perfect word every single time. You're gonna get door slammed in your fakes and you're gonna get um, stop to quit in your texts and you're gonna get uh, your, the phone um, hung up on you. But uh, but this is the work and um, we've got a lot of catching up to do because, you know, there are a lot of people on the wrong end, living on the wrong end of public policy that has been created because these people have had so much power and have been working at it so much. And if we're serious about them and we're serious about our country, then we've got to do the same, the same work. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. Um, yeah. Just thank you for that. I think that 
what you said about us <laughs> wanting nice speeches. Um, and, you know, I think Democrats often shy away from just saying that we want power, but like power is how we accomplish things. And I think we're seeing now, um, especially in the U.S. Senate, we have power, but not enough. And so like, there are so many places that we need more power to actually do, to fully do the things that we want. Um, and so I just have one more question for, for all of you. And Jessica, we can start with you and, and go around to um, uh, David and, and Abdul. Um, you all just kind of answered a question that, and I think this whole panel has shown why state legislatures are so important, why Democrats need to shift their focus there and then pay more attention. Uh, but for everyone who's joining us today um, and all the volunteers that we have, the people that we're trying to get to maybe take an action for the first time this cycle, what are some of the things that you would tell them to just close out this conversation about why it's so critical for them to actually spend their time and resources joining us in um, in these efforts. Well, well, first, thank you all for volunteering and for getting engaged. I know a lot of people are motivated to get engaged after 2016, so I really appreciate folks staying with us. When you volunteer at the state legislative level, your actions are more impactful than at any other level of the ballot. You, you're having these conversations in races that are decided by a handful of votes and maybe an entire legislature that's that's being decided by hundreds of votes. So every conversation that you have and everything that you do has increased and it, it just increased effectiveness because many folks may not have heard of the state legislative candidate that you're talking about. They may have seen the TV ads for the U.S. Senate race but they may not know about this person in their community. So that will help prevent people from not voting at the bottom of the ballot, which is something Gabby was talking about, but hopefully it also persuades potentially swing voters to, to come in and, and vote for the candidate. So it's a really effective way. Oh, you're on mute, David. It's only been three years of this. I haven't figured it out yet. Um, my thanks to a sister district and to Vote Save America and these inspiring panelists um, who will inspire you. Um, I'm going to try and scare you in this minute here. The US Supreme Court is about to hear a case called Moore versus Harper, which is going to give these already gerrymandered state legislatures and unearned Republican majorities potentially the power to rewrite election law, election procedures, election methods regarding everything from electoral maps down to election certification to how electors are, uh, are, are sent to Washington and the Electoral College. Um, if the US Supreme Court buys into this cockamamie ahistorical a theory that is so whacked out that you've got even conservative uh, uh, judges and 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 law professors uh, coming out now and filing amicus briefs at the Supreme Court saying this is nuts. This is not grounded in our history, in our constitution, in our politics, in anything. But if there's five votes on this court for this theory, these state legislatures in Wisconsin, in North Carolina, in Pennsylvania, in Arizona, in Georgia, that already have very little connection to actual majorities of voters in these states that regularly win majorities even when they lose the statewide vote by hundreds of thousands of votes, in states that in 2020 were oftentimes within 10, 11, 21,000 votes that could have tipped electoral colleges in wild directions, what happened on January 6, 2021 will be a dress rehearsal for the kind of constitutional chaos that we will see on January 6, 2025. You can prevent this by getting out and working in these state legislative races right now. Our democracy depends on it in places like Michigan and Pennsylvania and Wisconsin and North Carolina. Your work could make the difference between what kind of a country this is moving forward for all of us. So let me see if I can uh, if I can end on a high note here. Um, everything that that David and Jessica shared is true, and the danger here is um, I, I mean it's it's beyond four alarm fire. But the thing I, I ran for governor of Michigan in, in twenty eighteen, and the thing I really appreciated about a governor's race, unlike our national political conversation, is that 
so many of the conversations that we have nationally are really abstracted away from real people and real things. Whereas when you're doing the political work of helping to win a state legislative race, you're having really literally concrete conversations about who are we in this community? Do our, are our values represented in what we're choosing to fund? Tell me about the school that your kid goes to. Who funds that? What does it look like now? Or does it look like it did 30 years ago when you went there? Tell me about the state of the roads. Why are they not being built out and funded? Or that bridge that you have to cross that always gets plugged up by a train that gets stuck because the train's tracks are, are broken down. Who's responsible for that? What about the quality of the air that your kids breathe or the water that comes out of your faucet? Tell me about that. These are the conversations that you will have when you're engaged in these kinds of races, and they are the critical conversations of democracy. And so, you know, oftentimes, if you care about these things, if you cared enough to show up tonight to, 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 to engage in this conversation, you care about these issues. And while it may plug some aspect of our need to sort of get back yelling at the TV at some debate or uh, getting really angry and rage tweeting or, or doom scrolling, going out and actually having a conversation with real people in your community, you'll find that you have so much more in common, even if politically you disagree. That was my experience running. And beyond just helping to win state legislative races uh, for folks who don't want to end democracy, it'll also leave you feeling a lot more hopeful about where we are as a country and what's possible if we come together. So, you know, even if, if, if not just because it's more effective, um, but because it, it actually delivers a sense of a fellow feeling and bon ami that I think we're really missing in our political conversation right now, I hope that you all get involved. Perfect segue. Time for calls to action. This is, this is the segment where, where we encourage everyone to get involved for all the reasons that you've heard. Thank you, David, for, for uh, talking about the Moore v. Harper case. It was um, uh, September a year ago that you and I wrote uh, our first op-ed about it. And at the time, it seemed very fringe and far out there. And here we are where the, the Supreme Court will hear oral argument in December on that case that you know if folks haven't been following it, please follow it. This case could give state legislatures unchecked power over federal elections. Um, so we really need to follow that closely. This is, you know, 2024 is on the ballot this year. It's time for us to all get involved. Um, so call to action. Here's what I would say. You heard it from Jessica. These are tiny, close races. Seats and entire chambers are won at this level by a handful of votes, um, sometimes even less. When you volunteer with a state legislative campaign, you will, you know, you have the chance, and we at Sister Districts routinely talk to more voters during phone banks and on the doors than the candidate's entire margin of victory. Um, it's a huge return on your investment for your for your hour of time for your dollar. Uh, as you've heard from from all of our incredible panelists, these are our policy uh, laboratories. These are our leadership pipelines. Um, this is where the rubber hits the road on so many policies and issues that matter uh, in our life. So wherever you are, regardless of your state, there are things that you can do, even if you're in the reddest state uh, in the world, you know, Mississippi, we actually helped a legislator in 2019 uh, flip a candidate flip a seat in Mississippi um, by less than 100 votes that had been held by a Republican, the same Republican since she had been seven years old. So no matter where you are, um, there are great progressive state legislators on the ballot this year. Um, there's always opportunities to get involved with their campaigns. Um, it's really, really rewarding. You heard it from Jessica out on the doors talking to voters um, about the issues that matter. Join us at Sister District. We've got national phone banks rolling um, each week, several a week. They're super fun. We get together on Zoom. Uh, we often have special guests. We just had Abby Jacobson. We have Jonathan Van Ness joining us next week. We had Julia Louis Dreyfus a couple of weeks ago. Really, really fun folks who come uh, and and make calls with us. And and you know we we break and, and and mute ourselves on Zoom, and then everybody makes some calls, and we come back together and talk. Super fun. Spend an hour or two on the phones um, talking to voters. It makes a huge difference. Uh, our teams are also going to canvas in various parts of the country, Arizona, Nevada, et cetera. 
sign up at sisterdistrict.com. You'll get routed to your local team and you can find out about ways to phone bank and canvas and all the things and you know continue to learn and about state legislatures and stay involved in our work. So um, sisterdistrict.com is where you can find our national phone banks and um, signing up for our newsletter. Uh, and as we've all been saying, a little really does go a long way at this level of the ballot. Shaniqua? Yeah, um, and so again, we really want everyone to, to volunteer, so definitely do that. Um, but added to that, something else that came up um, a few times during our conversation is making sure you're talking to the people in your community and your family, your friend circles. And so um, this week, Vote Save America launched its ballot tool. You can go to votesaveamerica.com slash be a voter. Anyone watching today probably has already taken a look at their ballot or knows what's on it. Um, but if you don't, or if your um, friends and family need help figuring out what's on their ballot, who's on their ballot, you can go um, to votesaveamerica.com slash be a voter, type in your address and it will pull up a sample ballot for you. Um, and it'll go through um, all the different positions that are um, uh, up for election and statewide ballot initiatives as well. Uh, we have gone through all 100 plus statewide ballot initiatives and um, tried to put them in plain English so you can understand what a yes or no vote is. And for really important races, um, state legislature races, um, House races, uh, Senate races, governors, Secretary of State, AGs, we've gone in for really important competitive races and just put a little extra context in there for you to. Uh, provide a little bit of color about who the candidates are and what's at stake in that election. So we hope that you will use that tool for yourself, but also just spread it to everyone you know. It makes voting really easy. You can go in there, essentially fill out your sample ballot. Um, and, and I know some places don't allow you to have your phone in the voting booth, but you can print out what you um, researched and filled in and take that in. So voting is very simple. Um, but yeah, thank you all for joining us today. This has been great. We hope that you will take the last two weeks and just put all of the energy and effort you can into uh, voting yourself, but also making sure everyone else turns out. Um, all the races are important, but as we've spoken about today, state legislature races do not get the attention they need. And these folks have so much power. Um, I say this literally on every one of these we do. I am from North Carolina. I saw the impact of 2010. It still sits with me. Um, and uh, yeah, I, it's informed most of my career. And so I, I hope that one day we can reverse um, the impact of that because we are still dealing with it 12 years later. So thank you all. And I hope you all have a nice evening. And thank you to our panelists and, and to Gabby for co-moderating with me today. Thank you all. Margin of effort. We're in it. <laughs>